Um, I just want to kind of outline just a little bit before we get started, a wee bit is about the kind of purpose of, of today's session um, and introduce myself. I'm David Allen from Scottish Community Development Centre and the rest of the team. Um, PP team are with us this morning. Dawn, give us a wave. Sam, who's handling all the tech stuff this morning, give us a wave. Paul and Ellis as well. So we'll be kind of you know, loosely in charge of the session this morning. You know, you know how these things go. Um, any technical issues that you're experiencing, uh, let Sam know uh, in the chat or email him directly at sam at scdc.org.uk um, if there's a problem with your connection or uh, anything else technical wise, and we'll try and get that sorted out. I think, you know, when we, when we decided to do this session, we had a feeling that we're I suppose coming to the end of a period, hopefully coming to the end of a, a, a period of this, this awful pandemic that has hit us so badly over the last year and a half, nearly two years now. Um, uh, and it's hit other things as well to do with our work and it's hit participatory budgeting and, and people's genuine participation in community life uh, and influencing matters that affect community life as well. Um, and But what we've seen and heard from people in the network over the past um, few months is that I yeah, really want to get back into doing things. We need to get back and, and get PB going again, if you like, and re-energizing it and, and re-establishing it. Because I think what we've seen is there's nothing been more important than actual that community participation and public participation in community life that we've seen from people through the pandemic, which has been a core part of the, both the response and hopefully the recovery from COVID-19 as well. And we see PB has been a real key part of that uh, recovery and response. And that's why we want to have the session this morning and looking at the, the way forward for PB in Scotland uh, and what frames that, what can support that and what people are doing already or are planning to do as well. So it's really good to see so many folk here this morning. We had a big sign up for the session. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of folk probably not able to get here this morning as well. Um, so really delighted to see so many folk. I think we've got about 60 people on the call um, already with one of uh, quite a few apologies in uh, as well. So um, just a wee quick, quick run through what we're going to be covering. We're going to have a wee input shortly from, from, from Martin Johnston on the National Framework for PV in Scotland. I'll say a wee bit more about that framework before we get into um, some stuff from um, hearing from a couple of practitioners, people who have been delivering and developing PV in their local areas. Uh, and we're going to have a couple of breakout sessions as well before we come to a final panel session around about 12 o'clock. Uh, and that's your opportunity to submit questions uh, to the panel and we'll explain how that's going to work uh, when we get to that point in the programme. Um, but we're also putting in a first kind of Mentimeter question and link into the chat shortly, um, which is asking basically uh, how the National Framework for PB, which we'll be hearing about shortly, uh, can help or would help you in taking forward PB in your own work and in your own areas. Um, but to lead us into that, we're going to start off with a couple of um, short inputs. So I'm going to um, ask Martin Johnson, who's the chair of the National PB Strategic Group, um, to speak for a little while, just kind of gives a wee bit of a background on um, PB and the PB framework in Scotland. Thank you, David. And I just want to check that folk can hear me OK. OK. So several years ago, I was involved with a piece of work that asked 10,000 people to imagine a Scotland that was fairer, more equal and more just. And then to suggest what one key thing might help us to get there. Now, no one, to the best of my recollection, suggested participatory budgeting as the number one option. But actually, I reckon that if we can help to redesign our democratic structures so as the scales of participation are tipped deliberately in favour of those currently most marginalised will have come a long way. PB might be part, and I want to emphasise that word part, of what could help us to get there. 
So it's good to be with you this morning to help to introduce the framework for the future of participatory budgeting in Scotland, which, as Dave says, was published earlier this year. I'm going to try and cover three main areas uh, this morning. The background to that strategy, its content, and a wee bit about its future. So first, some background. In September 2020, the Scottish Government brought together a short life Life. working group to try to grapple with what the next steps for PB in Scotland should be. In the previous decade, there had been a growth in both understanding and using participatory budgeting, enshrining its principles and practices of PB in how we do democracy. Now, that's included the agreement between the Scottish Government and COSLA that 1% of council budgets will be subject to PB, as well as multiple examples of it being trialled in a variety of settings, including local schools and neighbourhoods. Scotland has become a bit of a trailblazer nation in this work. And next month, in actual fact, I'm speaking about PB at a conference in New York, fortunately in terms of carbon footprint from exactly the same room as I'm speaking this morning. There was a recognition at the same time as we were thinking about this of the challenges which, as Dave has pointed out, have arisen through the pandemic, but also about all that we were learning about the capacity of communities over these last two dreadful years. The group also went into this work with our eyes wide open that PB has an enormous amount to learn, is far from perfect, and needs to face up to some of the challenges of mainstreaming PB and of ensuring that it does what its architects in the global south sought to ensure that it was all about. That is that it is a model of democratic participation where those often excluded are enabled to participate more fully. The strategy group set as its ambition that in five years time, think about the time of the next Holyrood elections, that in five years time, Participatory budgeting is part of a core infrastructure of a constantly renewing democratic and community life across the nation. And before moving on, I think that it's really helpful to again highlight that word part. PB is not a silver bullet, not the only show in town, as we strive to ensure that democracy is deepened and decisions are taken at the most appropriate level. It is but one tool in a wider and growing tool bank. As the group met, it began to recognize the need both to deepen, make more effective PB, but also to widen it, helping it to grow in other areas. The strongest in local authorities, the group saw no good reason why it should not also be flourishing in other areas of public sector funding, and perhaps even beyond that. Diversifying without diluting would help to achieve the overall ambition as well as growing capacity and understanding. At the heart of the framework 16 priorities, and I'm not going to go through all of them, lies a recommended definition. Participatory budgeting is a democratic process in which citizens decide directly how to spend part of a public budget. No definition, of course, is ever perfect, and the group talked about this definition for a while, but we did want something that was as succinct and straightforward as possible. That will help people to differentiate between different elements of participatory or deliberative democracy 
and for them to complement one another rather than compete. This definition is part of a raft of recommendations or proposals designed to deepen PB and to connect it better with some of the governance and performance infrastructure, including, for example, the National Performance Framework. That's because we recognize that whether this is right or wrong, what we choose to measure counts. And if we want PB to count, we need to ensure that it can be measured and measured effectively. The second raft of recommendations focus on areas which cut across different strands of policy and practice. At the heart of that is the absolute commitment to ensure that PB addresses current inequalities and the democratic deficit that too many people in, in Scottish society face. As I indicated earlier, this was foundational in the early development of PB in the Global South and has been vital in every context where it's been used effectively. It has to be foundational in Scotland. We also, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the current context, identify green PB, a PB that was around tackling climate change and climate injustice as an important area of development and a commitment to this was specifically made and included within the programme for government. Again, one of the indicators of effective impact is that people from marginalised communities are involved in investment decisions around how we spend money in tackling climate change. There follows three further areas of development around health and well-being, around education and around housing, homelessness and the environment. In each of these areas, there have already been trials or work going on around PB, and the ambition is to see these develop over coming years. So that, that might include deepening work in schools, not only helping to inform better spending decisions, but growing democratic literacy amongst young people or work around sustainable transport solutions or the likes. These three spheres of working, I hope, offer an insight not just into the ambition, but also the way of working. What we want to do is to offer PB as a tool to those who are trying to tackle challenging and important areas of development. You want to grow participation in tackling climate injustice? Can PB help you to do that? It's an offer. You want to make the most informed and equitable decisions about sustainable transport? Can PB help you to do that? It's an offer. You want to involve people who know about homelessness in their direct lived experience to be involved in shaping what gets spent where. Can PB help you to do that? It's an offer. As Police Scotland, you're interested in working with local communities to build resilience. Can PB help you to do that? It's an offer. And so in that way, this is about flipping the framing and providing others with a tool that can help them to address the challenges that they're facing, to deliver on the changes that they've been asked to take forward, but actually which we all want to see happen. None of this replaces the work that's happening in and through local communities. But we hope that it plants the seeds more widely. It also must be said that we hope that this is not a flash in the pan. 
the strategy tries to lay out a way of working for the next significant period of time. We can't do everything at once. I would far rather we built this slowly, but built it sustainably. The National Strategy Group that will try to sit under this work and support it will never ever be about managing this stuff, but it will be rather about discovering, encouraging, cajoling, and striving to connect it up. It's, if you like, therefore, a bit of a community development approach to building a national framework. And I hope that lots of the people here today will inform, enable, encourage, and ultimately help to deliver on that strategy. And with that, Dave, I've probably said enough. Thank you very much, Martin. That was really useful and really informative. Um, pretty comprehensive guide to the thinking behind the framework and also what's contained in it. Um, people will see Ruth Fitzsam's posted a link in the chat to a um, section of our website, which um, takes people through all the themes in the framework as well. So I encourage people to have a look through that um, as we go or even after the session as well, if you've not already seen it. Um, and really useful to kind of set that in the kind of national context, Martin, and really useful. And thanks for, for coming along because I know, I know you're not feeling too great yourself today. So really appreciate you contributing to the session. Um, I want to kind of crack on now and move from the, the national to the local, because I think part of what we've been um, recognizing over the past wee while is, is real appetite and, and kind of energy amongst people to actually get PB going again in, in our communities. And want to hear from a, a couple of practitioners this morning who have been doing just that. Um, over the past a few months and a couple of years probably as well. For, first, I want to introduce Gordon Larkin, who's a community development worker in the Tannehill Centre in Fergusley Park in, in Paisley. Uh, and Gordon's going to tell us a little bit about um, the development of PB in Fergusley over the past few months, couple of years as well. And um, Gordon, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, I'll just share my screen first. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a community development worker in the Tanner Hall Centre. Uh, the Tanner Hall Centre is based in Felsa Park, Paisley. Uh, the centre is at the heart of the community. Uh, it's a base for the community library, the clinic, doctors, um, the nursery. We also get community markets from there once a week. And uh, it's also where the Felsa Park Housing Association is. Um, the Tannehill Centre has previously run successful um, PBs before uh, my employment with them. Um, when I came into post, I had very limited knowledge of PB. I knew it was a funding opportunity that was uh, decided by the committee. That was kind of, that was all I knew. Um, so last year was my first year running a PB process. So, to me, this was the normal way of doing things. Um, I started by recruiting some community volunteers with various ages and involvement in the community. Um, this wasn't an easy. Uh, this wasn't easy because it was had to be done through a uh, lockdown, so you couldn't get anybody face to face. It was all done through social media. To uh, message people through. Um, uh, Facebook Messenger to get their involvement. Um, sorry, I've got a bit of paper and I'm reading off a paper so that I remember. So that's how I keep looking to the side, Peter London. Uh, I managed to uh, recruit five volunteers. So they made up the decision committee with myself and Jamie, the business support manager, uh, business transformation manager, supporting them. Uh, this year, the committee decided that the applicant should focus on the promotion of good mental health, uh, reduce isolation and loneliness and boredom, 
raising the full estimates to support the community as restrictions eased as we got used to the new normal. We had a fund of 25,000. The most one applicant could apply for was uh, up to 5,000 pounds. We received 19 applications. The most the Tannock Centre has ever received. Applying for over 52,000. So that was more than double what we had. I imagine it was going to be, a, it wasn't going to be an easy task. Just, we used a scoring sheet um, with a simple yes and no to dwindle the applications down. The categories we asked them to focus on was what well, the, the focus, was we also judged them on, was it led by local people? Does it benefit people of Pelts of Park? And was it good value for money? And it was an open real community. We worked through the applications and managed to get it down to the required amount. We managed to fund or part from 13 of the 19 applications. From the 13 that we funded, three of them were state, um, streets within the community that put on various events within the street, put on street bingo, put on cinema nights, they put on Halloween parties, all within their, their wee street. Four of them were newly formed groups, and these groups have used the funding to develop themselves and to establish. One of these groups is Barrican Green Space. Margazata, who is the main driving force behind this group, applied for funding to help transform derelict land behind their house into a community garden. Margazata was a very active volunteer for lots of other projects, but this was the first time she decided to do it herself. Before they applied for the PB fund, Margazat had started clear, clearing the derelict ground and was being supported by our volunteer coordinator, Bobby. The group had transformed the area to make it safe for families. As it, they have created a trail throughout the part of the, the space for the kids and the big kids to enjoy. Um, they planned and held um, a fun day for the residents to attend and get lots of great feedback from the community about the community garden. The group are very keen to reuse and recycle anything. They've refurbished benches, picnic benches, so that they can use them within the park. They're working with uh, Frog Life to create a pond to encourage wildlife to visit the pond. And the pond will be created by um, some youth, some uh, young people within the community. While they're doing this, we're working towards um, different awards. And the, the hope of that is they'll take ownership of the garden and hopefully there'll be less um, vandalism within it. One of the most established the groups is uh, On Your Bike. On Your Bike is one of the most successful groups that started because of PB. Started due to their founder, Mark, going a walk around the local area and seeing a few discarded bikes lying around. Says that he had a light bulb moment, that he could fix his bikes up and other people could get used to them. <clears throat> Mark's, Mark, with the support of the Tannel Centre, was encouraged to apply to the PB to bring his idea to life. The rest of it was history, as they say. Mark applied for 4,630. This allowed him to buy the tools, equipment, and parts that he needed to get the project started. Mark started working out of the Tannehill Centre, but quickly grew too big for that space. He now works out of six containers located within the car park. He has six, six volunteers qualified in bike mechanics, four young volunteers, paid member of staff to help him find funding. Dear Mark and his team have repaired 984 bikes. There is 1,251. They've also refurbished 476 bikes that were destined for landfill. 312 of these bikes were given away for free to kids within Renfrewshire. The other 164 were purchased at a low cost to adults. On Your Bike has been so popular that they have a waiting list for people looking for bikes, repairs and servicing. They've also done some pop-up roadshows to take bikes that were getting dumped and do some smaller repairs. 
They have organised a cycle round the scheme event for the last two years. This year's event was funded by the Tanner Centre's PB. In the coming year, Mark hopes to work with more schools to introduce more kids to bike maintenance, repair 500 kids' bikes, service 200 bikes, donate another 200 bikes, and arrange another cycle round the scheme event. I'm sure he will smash all his targets again. Some of the more established groups of yeah, tied for celebrating Renfrewshire Fund. This is a PB fund run by Renfrewshire Council. On your bike, Dartwood Crew, Pals of Privies, Pals of Cameron, School of Dance, have all been successful in the past. On your bike, Pals of Privies and Dartwood Crew were successful this year. PB has allowed non constituted groups and individuals to apply for some funding to bring their idea to life. This has given non active community members the confidence to get involved. Fact that it's their own peers that make the decisions on where the funding is allocated is a great confidence booster. It's not just the applicants that get, gain confidence from the pro process, the community do also. I know that they had hand in deciding and a large chunk of funding to get spent. They also get the opportunity to attend these projects and events and keeps the community calendar full inspires future volunteers and groups. Without, BP, uh, without PB, a lot of this doesn't happen. And it's just, plays is just all the different groups that have tied PB and how successful they are. So this is Barrick and Green Space just now. You can see David's um, visited this. And this is just some quotes we've got from the community. And that's that's me. So I just I forgot I forgot I was just meant to click this all the way through. <laughs> You're fine, Gordon. That's Thanks it. Thank much. you everybody for listening. Thank you, Gordon. That was really impressive. I, I, I think for me the impact of the of um, what you've been doing over the past year and a half, particularly in very, very difficult circumstances, uh, is is huge. And you can see that I was really impressed when we went out and visited Tannehill a few weeks ago as well. And I know you as soon as it's it, it gets more easy to meet face to face to to continue to develop those processes uh, and develop kind of wider community and public involvement in that as well. So I think that's a really good, really good starting point and tremendously impactful for for, for the people in Ferguson. Okay, thanks to to Gordon for that. Um, we're going to go into a discussion group uh, now. The first kind of round of workshop groups. Um, we put um a link to Mentimeter in, in the chat. Um, and because we're not going to do feedback, because there's so many people in the session, so many small groups, we're not going to do feedback after the discussion groups. But we would ask you to consider a couple of questions within your groups. And that is, where are we now with PB? And how does the framework that Martin has, has described and talked about, how does that support your work with PB uh, as well? And feel free to respond to those questions in the, in the Menti um, as we go through the session and we'll pick that up either in, in the report of the session or in the panel session at the end if we get a chance to. Um, so those questions will frame your discussion. Uh, because there are so many groups, we're not going to be uh, facilitating any of them. We'll expect people to be adult and facilitate themselves. Um, but make sure you introduce yourselves to, to each other um, you know, have a run through, share where you are now, and then look at, and you'll have a bit of discussion about how the framework supports your work with PP. We'll drop in and out of the groups just to say, see how people are going, but you'll have half an hour in the groups and then we'll come back together before we give you a wee break. And um, so enjoy your discussions. Just like to get started in the second part of, of the session this morning, and we're going to start off this bit of the session with another practitioner input. Um, we're going to hear from Suzanne Thompson, who's Health Improvement Officer um, with Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership. And I'm just going to hand over to you just now, Suzanne, to take us through this next wee bit of the session. Thanks, Dave. I'll just uh, try and get my screen shared. 
Sorry, I look so dark. I'm not sure why. Um, but hopefully, as long as you can see my presentation, that's the main thing. Has that come up for everyone? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so as Dave said, I'm Suzanne and I'm a health improvement officer um, within the Aberdeen City Health and Social Care Partnership. So I'm here today to talk about the PB approach that we used for our locality improvement fund, um, which had a focus on alcohol and drugs. So for this fund, we partnered up with NHS Grampy and Aberdeen City Council, Aberdeen City Alcohol and Drugs Partnership, and our third face, third sector interface that we have up here called ACFO. Um, so our development of the fund, we wanted to engage um, and make sure this fund was created in partnership with the community. So we um, did a couple of engagement activities. So first of all, we carried out focus groups and surveys and made sure we heard from local people regarding what they thought the focus of the fund should be and also how they thought the fund should look and how that process um, should be implemented. So we um, had these groups and surveys made up with people um, with lived experiences and we also managed to get feedback from people that um, are part of our locality empowerment groups. So that was really helpful to be able to tap into those networks. Um, because our challenges came at, it was our first round of PB funding and we started at mid-lockdown. So obviously everything was online and it was quite challenging to try and interact with people. So it was great that we could tap into those kind of networks that we already had. And obviously being partnered with um, Aberdeen ADP, they do a lot of work with people with lived experiences. So that came in really handy to be able to work with them. Um, so from the feedback and engagement, um, it was identified that the fund should have a focus on prevention, so intervening before something becomes a problem, um, and early intervention, so responding where there's already a problem but trying to tackle it in its early stage. And the fund looked to identify projects that focused on the whole person or community, helping to build skills and resilience, and also involving people um, that the project aims to benefit. Um, so our principles were agreed upon from the feedback during the engagement process. However, we also kind of took into data from Scottful. Um, so that was in terms of drugs and alcohol, admissions to hospital and deaths. Um, and we also took into account trends that were arising as a result of COVID. Um, so there was a lot of reports of increased alcohol and drug use um, due to lockdown, people being on furlough and um, losing their jobs. And finally, we also took into account the principles of the partner organisations. Um, so it was decided that our principles should focus on just these ones on the slide here, improving emotional and mental well-being, addressing stigma and challenging social norms around alcohol and drug use, providing activities for young people at risk, providing acti activities for adults at risk of problematic substance use, and also support to family and loved ones um, for people that are affected by the alcohol and drug use. So our fund name, um, the Locality Improvement Fund, we... Um, carried on with our trying to get the community involved from the get-go. So we created a poll um, that was carried out with our locality empowerment group members. So we were they were given a selection of names um, and also a, an other section um, on the form. And they decided that the name should be Locality Improvement Fund as the focus really was within localities rather than um, citywide applications. So they chose the name um, and then we um, started advertising for applications. So we received 18 applications in total. Um, it wasn't as much as we'd hoped to have received and um, just from other fundings that we'd uh, carried out, but recognised that people were experiencing funding fatigue and there'd been a lot of funding stream streams coming up because of COVID. Um, so people had maybe applied for those funds um, and also the restrictions were making it a bit difficult for people knowing what they could and couldn't do um, regarding numbers of people coming along to sessions and um, if you're allowed to do in session uh, in-person sessions so um, there was a number of factors that we think maybe reduced the number of applications we thought we were going to receive so this was our decision making process and um, so as I said it was um, this process was come up with um, in partnership with the community and um, so the panel was made up of, so we received our um, applications and then the three locality panels um, assessed the applications. So the panels were made up of local people um, and people with lived experiences and people could apply to be on the panel and this was advertised through our partners and on social media. Um, again, we were limited with our promotion we could do around this um, just because of the COVID um, restrictions.
um, the panel members recommended applications to the public vote. So as I said, we got 18 applications, um, but at this stage of the panel, so um, they decided to remove four applications. And um, this was just because they felt that the, the applications didn't meet the uh, focus or the principles of the fund. Um, and then the recommended applications were made available online. So we were really lucky as we partnered with ACVOTE, their um, comms guy is really good. And he helped us put together um, a website where we could put up all the applications, um, information for everyone to see. And we also requested that the successful applications that were going to the online vote sent in a video, just describing what their project was. So we managed to get that all up on the website, which was great. Um, and then we moved on to the the online vote so it was just people living and working in Aberdeen that could vote um, and we used citizen space for this so that was really good it gave us the option to ask people the start of people's postcodes just to make sure that people um, that were voting were eligible and um, so the list of projects from each locality was compiled um, and then the panels approved the final allocations so um, as we had a larger amount of money available and um, then what the applications we had so we had around 150,000 um, available but the total of applications in the first place didn't actually um, add up to this so what we decided when um, we had to look at various research around we still wanted to follow the PB process so we decided that the successful projects um, should have at least 10% of the vote to be successful so as you can see here we got 760 votes in total and um, from the online vote we actually did have a bit more than the 760, but we, um, on the postcode bit, we were finding that there were some people from Edinburgh um, and Glasgow, Aberdeenshire, were putting in their votes. So we had to um, sort through them and remove them. So we ended up with the 760 votes. And um, so um, with the 10%, you needed 70, at least 76 votes to be successful. So um, only two projects were unsuccessful um, out of the uh, total that went to the vote. Um, and so what uh, went well, we did engagement throughout the whole process. So the community was involved and this meant that the process and the fund really represented the community's needs and we got the buy-in from them straight away as they felt really involved and they took ownership of that fund. And the public vote was really good. And we added a little section on the online vote form and to request feedback of how people felt it was. And um, for the most part, feedback was really good. People felt it was really easy to get onto the vote, really easy to understand the form. Um, so that was really good. And we got a lot more engagement than we ever imagined. When I put it live, I was going to be happy with 10 votes. And um, so that was really good. Um, our locality discussions were really um, good in the screening panels. So that some of them actually led to unintentional link ups. Um, one project helped get transport. And um, so one project had asked for, I think it was money to um, rent some minibuses. But a person who was sitting on the screening panel said, oh, actually, we have um, minibuses that are free that day, so they could use that. And they were able to donate that to that project and reduce the amount of money that they were requesting and also make those local link ups, which was really good. Um, raising awareness of community needs and also volunteering opportunities. So that came back in our um, feedback on the online vote as well. Lots of people were saying they were going to get in touch with the projects and ask if they could um, take part. People were commenting on that they didn't know those needs were in their community and it was really interesting for them to be a bit more aware of that. Um, and finally, uh, community connectedness. So people taking ownership of the decisions and supporting their community. There was a lot of positive feedback of people saying that they were really thankful that they got, got to decide um, what people in their communities could go along to and what projects would take place. So that was some really positive feedback from there. Um, so our areas for improvement. Um, from our previous fundings, um, pre-COVID, we had spoken about doing a kind of champion model, um, getting people in the community trained up, um, and kind of understanding all the principles of the fund and being able to speak to people in their local community about it. But just because of time scales and the COVID restrictions, um, this got put on hold, but we're hoping to get it um, put into place for future rounds. Um, so that would be really good. Um, support for applicants. So we did offer support um, in the application stage and also um, with the videos 
um, that we requested for the online vote. But um, I think our time scales were maybe a bit too short for people um, getting the videos in. So, um, so we offered support for that too, but I think our time scales are a bit too short. So um, next time we'll um, make sure that that support's there for them to get. And also, I think it was only about a week we gave them, so a bit longer um, in that. Um, our digital exclusion. So we did only do it online and this relied on people having access um, to digital means, um, seeing the promotion on social media or seeing it through if they were involved with the charities um, or that were requesting money. Um, so we would have liked to have visited places in person to get votes. So going into schools or sheltered housing and um, care homes, but obviously restrictions and um, put that on hold. So for next time, that's something that we're really looking to do. There was also a really good feedback in um, online form and someone suggested to have a stall in a supermarket or a shopping mall um, and just kind of stop people as they go past and have an iPad that um, people could vote on. So that's something we're thinking about as well. Um, and also um, our locality and citywide applications. So as it's in the name, the Locality Improvement Fund, um, we were just looking for locality um, projects, um, but some um, organisations were looking to do citywide projects and they ended up putting three applications in um, into the fund, which um, wasn't allowed, but it hadn't actually kind of, it did say in our guidance, but I don't think it was clear enough as it should have been. So we've now updated that um, for future just to make sure that people only apply for one locality and other projects get the chance um, around the city. Um, so our considerations for the future and um, to have a showcase and learning event. So to ask the successful projects to come along um, and discuss their projects and what they've learned from doing the PB process and also from their projects. So we've had a couple in the past from other funding and um, streams that have been really successful. Um, just before COVID, we had a, we called it a gardening gala. So all the projects that have been successful um, from our health improvement fund um, came along and it was really good. People spoke about um, various gardening tips and um, some um, projects even had spare flowers that they were able to give out. Um, and it was a really good networking event. So we're looking to do that um, when time allows with COVID. Um, learning from the approach. So it was really good to get the community involved and people with lived experience in from the start. Um, they really helped to shape it. And obviously we've got a lot of feedback from our online vote form that we're gonna take into account um, in regards to getting out and about into um, shopping centres and things to ask for people to vote that maybe you wouldn't normally vote. Um, and also we had an under, a huge underspend, um, as I said earlier, so we had 150,000. Um, so it was, due to be 50,000 for each locality. And um, unfortunately, just because we didn't have as many applications as we'd hoped, we couldn't um, spend all that. So the, the underspend um, was used. It went to, um, we have fit like hubs up here. So these are um, health and wellbeing hubs um, for um, young people and families to go along to. Um, and they can work with various um, organizations to set goals and um, access advice on um, benefits and things like that. So the money still did go to good use. Um, and that is me. Um, thank you very much for having me. I hope I didn't um, blabber too much. I'll try and you unshare my screen. Thank you very there much for that. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Suzanne. That was really informative and really, uh, again, another thorough description of a, a really good PB process. And I think the kind of thing that's striking me is from both presentations, it's just about learning as you go and about adapting to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I think that's probably the beauty of locally designed, locally led, locally run and informed PB processes that they are ultimately practical, responsive to the needs of the community and the conditions that you, you find yourselves in, which is you know, really, really kind of sound. Okay, we're gonna get um, go back into uh, another round of um, breakout groups now. Uh, actually, just to, and the focus on this this um, round of groups is uh, now looking kind of how, how do we move forward, um, what do we need to do next, and, and what are the gaps, and what do we need to progress PB in our communities as we emerge out of the pandemic. Um, hi, everybody. 
welcome back. I think that's just about everybody back in the room now. Um, hope those discussions were productive, useful, informative, engaging. And um, got some nodding heads around the screen, which is good. Um, great. Now, the, the, the next stage of the process um, this morning, or now just into this afternoon, um, is to, we're going to do a panel session. Um, and the panel members are going to be Kathleen Glasick from Scottish Government, um, Martin Johnston, who you know, uh, introduced earlier on, um, Gordon, uh, again, who I, uh, Lord Larkin, who I introduced earlier on as well, who you heard from, and also Don Brown from the SCDC team. And Don's got a long history with PB prior to joining SCDC as well as being involved in our PB work just now. And um, so we're going to, I'm going to chair it and we're going to pin um, the, the panel members there as well so you can, so you can see them um, when, when we're going around the, uh, asking the questions of them. And thanks to all the groups for submitting your panel questions on Menti. And I'm going to try and cover as many as we can uh, before we finish off the session. We are aiming to finish the session by half 12 at the latest. So I'm just going to kick off. Um, and come up with the first one that's on my screen, actually. Um, and it's, does sustainability of projects come into the PB funding framework? Um, and I'd like to ask that first of all of, I think, Kathleen, I think I'll put you on the spot with this one. Um, would you like to respond to that? So can you repeat the question, please, Dave? Does sustainability of projects come into the PP funding framework? It's a bit of a tricky question, that. Um, I'm not really sure what it means. But does the person who asked the question want to maybe elaborate? Yeah, could we maybe have a few? I don't know who submitted that yeah, in, the, in the room. Hi, this, it was Anne-Marie Smith that asked the question. question. Get a bit of feedback. Thanks. So in terms of sustainability and projects, we're always looking for um, can the projects be sustained beyond the funding applications that they're um, putting in place? So is that built into the PB expectations or is that just down to local interpretation or local requirements when funding applications are being put in? Okay, Kathleen, is that something you want to respond to? I would say probably that from, from my perspective it comes, comes into, it depends on local circumstances and how you define what people are applying for. Through, through the PB processes, and that should be subject to, I suppose, that involvement of of local people in that process as well. And Kathleen, I don't know if you're kind of want to come in, come in on that. Kathleen, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, you would think by now I would know to unmute myself. Um, yes. So. Yeah, as David was saying, I think that really is uh, dependent on, on on the local situation um, and, and, and what, what suits the local situation. Um, the, the, the framework doesn't really look at funding. Um, it's a drivers for change and it's for broadening PB across the sectors, across sec public sector in Scotland. So I think your question would relate more to uh, local perspective and local decision making. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question now, actually, because I think this kind of cross cutting has come up a couple of times in the in the board as well. So, uh, it's what processes or measures can be put in place to ensure we truly reach marginalised or often unheard groups rather than those that shout the loudest. So I'm going to fling this open to the panel, but I'm, maybe I want to start with yourself first, Dawn, 
Actually, I know we've been looking at this in the in our work recently as well. I want to come to you first, though. Thanks. I suppose in terms of processes and measures, when we're talking about reaching reaching marginalised groups, it's about good capacity building support for a start when you're looking at that engagement process and getting people engaged as early as possible in the process and using the links and networks that are already there. Um, I really hate the term hard to reach because people aren't hard to reach. It's about putting in the effort to actually go out and be where they are. Um, so if we can if we can do that, and then when it comes to the actual voting processes, there's there's all kinds of things that can be put in round about weighted voting, so that a vote for a group that you know is is dealing with equalities issues may be worth three votes that are that are for a normal project. And again, that that comes down to setting up in your processes at the start and actually making sure that your your steering group or the the group that you're working with to actually deliver the PB process are aware of these different opportunities that are available to them there that can that can be put into place. I say weighted voting is is a really easy way to, to do it to actually make sure that you know uh, groups that might not be as as sexy or as as interesting actually get the support that that's required for them. So you can look at you know whether it's one vote or three votes that they get and, and different ways of different ways of weighting that. So there are processes and that can be put into place. And it is just about that bit about getting out and being where people are, talking to them, explaining the process, making things as simple as possible without talking down to people. We don't need to, to talk down to make processes simple and just make sure that, you know, good capacity support is there at all stages of the process. Thanks, Dawn. Does anybody else from the panel want to come, come, come in on that one? Hey, Martin, you've got your hand up. Martin, are you here on it? Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I suspect for me, it, it is certainly emphasising what, what Don's just said there, that, that quite often it's actually people with power who are the hard to reach. Let's just be honest about that. Uh, and so if you are a person with a disability, then in actual fact, your city councillor or your MSP or your MP or whoever or your council official they're the hard people to reach uh, and so we need to stop using that language or actually use it about ourselves rather than about other groupings. Um, I think for me one of the ways that I've seen that shift being enabled to happen in places across the world has actually been in that steering group stage where actually not only might you wait the voting process, but actually you deliberately wait the composition of the steering group that sets up uh, the overall process. So it's actually you're deliberately ensuring that those who are marginalized in adverted commas have a greater representation on that group than those who have power, in inverted commas. And if you change that balance at that point in the process, then you probably, particularly if you're into doing this on a repeating basis, if you do that, then actually instinctively over a period of time, you change the way power is actually organised within that system. Thanks, Martin. That was really, really useful. Uh, Kathleen, you wanted to come in on that, sir. Yes, I, ju I just wanted to add to that, that that's the reason when we had the Community Choices Fund uh, for, part, for PB, uh, we built in uh, part of that fund was for uh, building capacity and for practical support for communities taking part and for organisations to, to apply. So, for example, we built in money for, for Childcare for um, um, anything, any need for accessibility, for any language barriers, um, and, and everything like that. Because it is really important if we want to reach those furthest from from power, we have to build that capacity, and that's what we've been doing over the last five to six years with seven million pounds invested in PB so far. So yes, I agree 100% that we need to build that capacity and offer that support for it to be accessible and inclusive. And I feel that's what we've been trying to do. 
And I want to mention that uh, many on, on here today will know that the Community Choices Fund now forms part of the Investing in Communities Fund. And uh, there's a new, uh, that's going to be opened up again in March or April next year. And there's a webinar happening at the end of this month. I'll put a link to that webinar to hear more information about the Investing Communities Fund in the chat. Uh, and people might find that helpful. Thanks, Kathleen. Yeah, I think there are two webinars coming up on them over the next three or four weeks, so that would be useful. Uh, I think just kind of to pick up on that, there is another question um, in which kind of relates on that and builds on that last point, Kathleen. Um, and it is with the existing framework. Oops, sorry, I'll just close my screen. With the existing framework and the Scottish Government and COSLA's direction of travel, what are the plans for making sure that those furthest removed from power are supported to be involved? For example, disabled people would require a lot of capacity building support. Um, you mentioned investing in communities fund there, Kathleen, obviously, is there anything else um, in terms of the framework, how we intend to ensure that those people who are furthest away from, um, from, from this process are able to be supported to be involved? I mean, that's, that's why we're, we're continuing with the National Support Programme. Um, Tom Arthur, uh, the minister, the new minister is 100% behind uh, participatory budgeting. And we still have the work that we uh, support with, with yourselves as Scottish Community Development Centre and other organized, national organisations to offer that support. But we also have a team in Coslo who supports um, local authorities and one of the things that we're investing in is a digital platform console uh, to ensure that people can vote if, if we can't meet in person like we haven't been able to for the last few years. So that um, support continues and I think it's a very important part of the PB process. Okay, thanks Kathleen. Anybody else from the panel want to, to come in on that? Okay, or I I think all I would say in that is I think we've got a heck of a long way to go and it's really, really important that, that people are held to account for the fact that we've got an awful long way to go. One of the reasons why I think the framework talks a bit about trying to integrate more fully into things like the National Performance Framework, which although it kind of sounds a bit nerdy, is, is actually that thing about uh, what you measure counts and therefore actually trying to ensure that we count or measure PB processes is really important. But we do that very deliberately through the lens, not just of saying how many PB processes were there, but actually much more deliberately about to what extent did these PB processes narrow the gap so that those who feel most disenfranchised at present feel more able to participate in decisions that impact their lives. Thanks, Martin. And I think I would probably add to that a little bit as well, is that, I mean, again, I mentioned all earlier that it's really good to see both all kind of, kind of projects um, evidencing that they were learning from what had happened previously and um, adapting their processes for, for the future for next time round. And we've also supported that through our training through PB Scotland and um, looking at uh, different ways of evaluating and reviewing and PB at uh, both a kind of local, direct local level, but also um, that kind of wider, wider impact level as well. And I think that's really important. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm conscious of time, we've probably got about 10 minutes more left to go in this. So I'm going to another question here. Um, okay, how do we enhance awareness of what works and how we build good PB? So how do we develop that awareness of what works and how do we build good PB? Um, Gordon, I'll come to you first. With, uh, first of all, because I've not come targeted you yet in this, uh, this this panel session. So, how do you build awareness of what works locally, uh, and how do you kind of um, take that forward in, in your community? Um, good promotion of the the projects that's working. So, like, yeah, when you're bike, your pals of babies, um, that would lots. 
booked in Fergus at the minute, and a lot of them have been through PE. Um, so we've got like the Dark who are a great group. That we've um, met the Dark Recruit who do the community market, the community meal, um, they just they do lots of stuff. The bingo bus, mm -hmm. anybody seen that on BBC News or something as well. I think they've been on the one show as well. So they, they started, they all started coming through PE. So the PE process for girls has been really successful. And that's encouraged just promoting these groups constantly and promoting through social media and just saying yeah. how they come through the process of PB. That seems to encourage other people to say, if they can do it, we can do it. So that's bringing yeah. it on. Thanks, Gordon. That's, that's really useful, that, that kind of local level approach. Don, um, I'll come to you as well. How do we, how do we can, I suppose, demonstrate the worth of of P. Why, why is it good to, to do PB? Just an easy one for you. As Gordon was saying, it's about shouting about the wins that we have. It's about sharing when processes are going well. It's events like this really help us build the profile of PB. You know, obviously the, the audience today is interested in PB, but hopefully you're going to go and talk to your colleagues about it and say, you know what I was hearing about today, I heard about, you know, Aberdeen City ADP and the great work that they were doing. I heard about Gordon at the Tannehill Centre and the work that they've done and it gets people excited and then we go and we we kind of have those conversations with, with people that aren't of the same mindset. It's about sharing the resources that we do have so that the PB Scotland Network um, and the website there, there's some really great resources on there to, to build awareness of good PB tying our processes in to use the, the resources that are there so that the charter is really great as well. And actually just publicizing that it's there, getting people to, to talk the same language and to, to just share when PB is really working. So we've got so many great examples and it's sometimes just about finding the, the right ways to, to link people up and have those conversations. The awareness of PB is also going to grow as we move into the mainstreaming agenda and hopefully see really good sound processes happening in different local authorities that will again really get people involved in a much wider scale. And when we see that kind of democratic interest from, from people, lots of people are going to start shouting about, you know, why are we only getting involved in this decision? Where, where are we in that decision and how do we get involved in that bit? And I don't want it just to be small grants. I want it to be, you know, big decisions that matter to my community. So it's just going to be little steps. But every time something goes well, we need to really shout about it. And when it doesn't go well, we need to not be afraid to take the time to reflect on it and say, how can we improve this next time? It's that constant improvement conversation to go on. Thanks, Don. OK, I'm going to move on to, because you just happened to mention, I think, mainstreaming there as well. I think there's a question in, in the Menti. Does it look like small grants PB will disappear with the 1% or the mainstreaming becoming a focus? That's an interesting one. Does anybody from the panel want to respond to that um, initially? Oh, we're, not, we're all dying to answer that one. Dying okay. to answer that one. Uh, no, I, I can put it there, David. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I hope not, is the answer. I think the small grants is very, very important. Um, as much as mainstream is important in involving communities in the wider decisions uh, within a council or with any public authority, but I really think that the small grants is hugely important and that that excitement in, in in the hall with you know hundreds and hundreds of people coming and going and meeting each other um, and voting for what they want to happen in their local community I think that is key um, to, to PB it's important but I, I appreciate that mainstreaming is absolutely also important so I, I would hope that they will go hand in hand as we progress with PB across Scotland Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Martin, did you want to, to, to come in on that as well? Yeah, so I think that's right, Kathleen. I would probably want to avoid a thinking of something as linear uh, and that somehow we move from small to mainstream. I think we kind of need to try and think about that as an infinity loop 
that's going on all the time. Um, and the, the key thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to build the muscle of people's participation in our society. And that sometimes the way you base build that muscle is in the small actions, and sometimes it's in the big actions. But unless actually you're deliberately trying to use both, you then end up with a muscle that doesn't actually work properly. Uh, and so I think it's about doing both of those, but recognizing all the time the interconnection between them rather than actually saying that, that one trumps the other all the time. It does depend on the particular circumstances, I think. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, and if you are nodding heads around the room with, with, with that one as well. OK, conscious of time, maybe just another couple of questions to, to run through before we finish up. Um, right, here's an interesting one. Language around PB is a challenge. How do we fix it? Anybody want to chip in there from the panel? Gordon, I'll come to you actually. How do you explain, how do you get across PB um, to people in the community of Fergusley, for example? I mean, the language we do use around PB can be a bit challenging and a bit jargony at times. How do we so, fix that? <clears throat> um, I've got an advantage because I'm from Fergusley. So I, I, people tend to be more relaxed about me and and I, I'm one of them, basically. Um, so it's easier for me to explain it. I, I explain it the way I understand it. So I just explain it to them that way. Um, and I don't know, it just seems to, it seems to work for me. Um, I managed to recruit people and we managed to get the most applications we've ever had, so it must have worked. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an important thing. Sometimes it's not the, the language you use, but who uses it. Yeah, it can be as can be as important and uh, as anything else. So obviously, people who are res respected, trusted, uh, and grounded in their communities are much more likely to be able to get a message across um, than than other people who are not, you know, are coming in from outside as well. Anybody else from the from the panel want to to comment on that? Um, if I could come in there, David, um, I mean, yeah, participatory budgeting, it doesn't roll off the, the tongue very easily. And um, that's where the words community choices came from. It was one of our previous ministers and cabinet secretary who came up with community choices. And that's when we started calling it community choices. But participatory budgeting is, is a world known brand, and it is a brand. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. It is participatory and it's budgeting. And if we move away from those two words and the language that's used around it, then people try and move away from the budgeting or they'll try and move away from the participation. So as a world known brand, a global brand, we, usually, we, we stick to participatory budgeting. We just call it PB and then we, we try and make it as accessible as, as we can. Really good point, Catherine. Just about that kind of, it is, it is a world brand. We were myself and Don were were, were both in a session on Tuesday, part of a global P PB network. We were speaking to people from Chile, Australia, um, Kenya, USA, and so on. And that brand is well recognised across the world. And people describe that differently in in different countries and in different settings as well. But fundamentally, it is about our participation in influencing budget decisions uh, and, we, and we mustn't lose that and what Martin was saying at the start of the session today was being very clear about that definition and that kind of grounds us in, in what we're trying to do and how we're trying to take it forward. Okay, right, um, time for one last question I think. Um, Right. How do we get good moving on to kind of mainstream PB again? How do we ensure clear roles and responsibilities for mainstream PB exist? And how are they made part of kind of measurement and evaluation um, within mainstream organizations? Uh, anybody want to kick us off with that one? Uh, 
and panel rushing to put up their hands on, on that one. Martin, I'm going to come to you actually, uh, because we're, we're looking at the balance between small grants and mainstream PB, but how do we actually, I suppose, get that bedded in much more into uh, mainstream, mainstream processes and how does that accountability, I suppose, follow through on? And, and a bit of my honest answer around that, Dave, is I'm not entirely sure. Um, I do think the pretty core within this is that we need to stop pretending that the work we do around PB is on an annual basis and on an ad hoc basis. Uh, and instead, we need to actually be ensuring that and, and many local authorities are doing this, certainly the Concordat says, you know, 1%. So actually we need to get much better at saying, well, if it is 1% year on year, as a minimum, how do we then ensure that we're planning for that in May rather than December? And how are we planning for it in 2025 rather than 2021? Uh, and, and actually, once you get into a situation where actually you're planning those things in the longer term, it then means that almost by default, you need to build in a much more robust, effective monitoring and evaluation process of whether or not you're doing it right or not. If you're doing it ad hoc at the last minute, you then end up with an ad hoc at the last minute evaluation process. And I think that that is the thing that prevents us from actually genuinely moving this into is part of the mainstream of how we work. Martin, thanks for that. That's a really good answer to that question. I think it is something we probably want to take away from this session is that just how we make it part of what we do actually, and coming back to um, the way you set up the session earlier on. Folks, I think we've we've run out of time. Um, we've not answered all the questions, but we will follow up on um, how the questions that we're, we haven't managed to, to come to and we'll um, respond to them either via the website or through the report on this session. Um, but I just want to kind of thank um, all our contributors and today. I want to thank Martin, Gordon, uh, Suzanne, for their contributions today and for Kathleen for the contrib and Dawn for the contributions to the panel as well. Um, we have a question come up in the, the chat there, can we share the website address? Yeah, I'm sure Sam, if you can stick that in uh, for people just now as well, that would be, re that'd be really good. I just want to thank everybody for the contribution to the discussions as well. Um, they've, they've been really good. I've looked at the comments coming through on the mentees and the questions as well. Really inspiring, really motivating, really good position I think we find ourselves in just now to you know continue to take forward PB in a robust fashion over over the coming months and years. Before we let you go, we, we want to just ask you if you you give us a wee bit of quick reflection on the session today and we'll stick yet another mentee link into the chat. And um, if you could open that that and just take a couple of minutes to to complete that before you leave and then we'll then we'll let you go if you like as well. Thanks everybody for your contribution again today.